Hi, <laughs> welcome to today's session on the economy of love. Uh, just a quick bit of housekeeping. Um, all questions, if you could please place them in the question box on the side as we can't actually see the chat function and answer questions from there, that would be great. And then please do also join us after today's session if you'd like to continue uh, question and answers with our panel on Zoom. Uh, the Zoom link for that will be posted later on in the chat at the end of the session. So uh, just to quickly begin, um, I am Nina De Winter from the Biodynamic Association. My role here uh, encompasses working on the marketing and supply chain development for both biodynamic and organic licensees here in the UK. And on today's panel, uh, we have Julie Brown from Growing Communities. Hi, welcome, Julie, um, who you'll meet in a minute. Growing Communities is a social enterprise that runs a thriving community-led box scheme, an all-organic weekly farmers market, um, urban market gardens, and training for urban growers. Alongside her, we have Johanna Saxler from Regional Wort Age in Germany. Uh, they're a farm-to-consumer cooperative set of organizations and businesses that work together to get good value for each partner in the food chain. They also enable citizens in the area access to fresh food um, that's grown and produced locally. Uh, so it's through investment of locals in the cooperative shares that they have been able to set up and support this infrastructure of local food for local people. And the last member of our panel is Patrick Holden, who is the founder and chief executive of the Sustainable Food Trust, an organization working internationally to accelerate the transition to more sustainable food systems. Prior to that, Patrick was the director of the Soil Association, and he currently farms 300 acres in West Wales. Welcome, Patrick. And to finally introduce our main speaker for today, uh, Halmi Abulish. He is the CEO of the Sakem Initiative in Egypt, which was founded in 1977 with using biodynamic methods to re-green parts of the desert and therefore also create a thriving agricultural business. He's a Right Livelihood Award winner, as well as being president of the Biodynamic Federation Demeter International. Welcome, Halmi, and over to you. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. I'm very happy to be here at the Oxford Real Farming Conference 2021 and happy to share with you some of the experience we have, or we could uh, gather here in the desert in Egypt over the last 43 years. Let me quickly go into the topic of this uh, presentation today. It is economy of love. Ektesad uh, al-Mahabba, as my father called it. Now, how does all this come uh, into one uh, initiative, economy and love? Let me start by just uh, tell you that um, it is... Um, I hope I'm now right, yes, that it is my father who in 1977 uh, introduced this concept of economy of love within a bigger dream. He had this dream and vision of a community which uh, he wanted to set up in the desert uh, in Egypt where people can live and learn and work together and where they can unfold the individual potential where they can live in a community with respect and dignity and where they can produce ethically and environmentally sound products. And all this sounded a nice dream and uh, a nice vision until my father pinned it down to some principles. One, that he wanted to achieve this on the base of biodynamic farming, which was never used in, uh, in the desert before. And second, uh, he wanted to uh, achieve this by introducing uh, what he called Ektasad al-Mahabba, economy of love, into the management of the supply chain, where it was all about uh, seeing and uh, supporting everyone in the supply chain. And, giving everyone a fair share of the added value or the profit. And you must imagine that Egypt, which was just coming out of a 
socialist regime uh, was on a totally different path. And so everyone in Egypt and from outside Egypt told him biodynamic farming in the desert is not going to work and Iqtisad al is communism and is going to be bankrupt very soon. So a no-go. Uh, he was very optimistic and said he is going to do it anyhow. And not only that he will uh, introduce biodynamic farming in the desert and Iqtisad al but also he said that in Sekem we will have to care foremost for people and for the unfolding of their potential which everyone told him is not and nothing of his business. And to make it even worse, he said, we want also to care for the community around us. And then it was very clear to my, our family and his friends that he was a hopeless dreamer and will never achieve anything and that this is a mission impossible. Against all odds, uh, <laughs> this is why I'm here today, a miracle unfolded over this 40 years from 1977 until 2017 when he passed away. And in these 40 years in the desert, an oasis was created on the base of biodynamic farming where all kinds of crops available in Egypt uh, are grown. Thousands of farmers all over the country grow biodynamic products. 2,000 people work in the Sekem community Thousands of people live around us and in the Sekem community with their families. Hundreds of kids go to our schools. 3,000 students go to our university for sustainable development. And uh, we produce foodstuff, pharmaceutical products and textiles, mainly for the Egyptian local market, where we are market leaders with about 800 million filter bags of Demeter filter bag tea in uh, supermarkets and pharmacies all over the country. So the question obviously <laughs> whenever somebody visits us is how was it possible? How did this happen? And uh, the other question obviously was also what is going to happen after the visionary founder is not going to be with living within the community. And so in 2017 when my father at the age of 80 years serving 40 years of them in Sekem, passed away. We, the Sekem Future Council, some members of the Sekem Future Council came together and asked ourselves what and how are the next 40 years going to look like. And uh, it, it was very obvious that there are different options. And the most obvious one of them was that we could just go for more farms and more filter bags and more kids in school and more students at the university and more patients at the medical center and continue to grow as we did. But going through a real you journey, a presencing journey where we tried to open ourselves to what does the future want from us, we came up with a total different vision for Sekem in 2057, in 40 years. And we thought that the next uh, task we have to tackle is how can we disseminate the ideas which we were developing in this 40 years from 77 to 2017 into the Egyptian society? How can all the models, whether it's biodynamic farming, uh, holistic uh, schooling or a holistic university, integrative health center, or the economy of love, really reach everyone in Egypt, inspire people and organizations, entrepreneurs, civil society to go into the same direction. And because this will actually not be then anymore measured as a vision for SECEM, we developed what we called the SECEM Vision 2057 for Egypt and set some visionary goals in all four dimensions of sustainable development in the societal, cultural, ecological, and economic sphere. So we envision that Egypt will be 100% organic in 2057, that Egypt will have holistic education in all its schools, 
and universities in 2057, that all citizens of Egypt will engage and take ownership of the country and contribute to its new governance system and social transformation. And last but not least, that all companies and entrepreneurs of Egypt will engage in the economy of love. And there it is, economy of love, one of our 18 taken vision goals for Egypt 2057. What does it really mean? And uh, do we need another uh, scheme or name for an economic system which is uh, going to be uh, used beyond biodynamic, organic, agroecology, beyond fair trade and SA8000 and many, many other schemes which are already available. And for us, it was very, very obvious that yes, we believe that there are missing uh, dimensions on the current uh, certification schemes for businesses in the organic and biodynamic arena. How come? Now, we believe that there are four questions which consumers in the world want to know about products. In their absence, these consumers uh, will not have any real basis for sound decisions what to buy. But if we would give them information on what is the impact of the product they are buying on first, the environment, second, the people and the community, third, the individual potential unfolding of each one of us, and fourth, about the transparent value distribution, the real cost, the true cost, and the fair price, people would chose different. We strongly believe in the power of the consumer. We strongly believe that it's not only the multinationals, politicians, scientists, you name them, who are responsible for the economy, the depleting, unsustainable economy we have all over the world, but we believe we as consumers, we are part of the problem and part, a big part of the solution. And we believe that there is no consumer in the world who wants to destroy the world, who wants to destroy the environment, his community, who does not want to engage in unfolding potential or does just want to pay unfair prices. So the whole question is, can we give him the right information to make his sound and correct decisions? And yes, obviously we can build such a scheme on organic and biodynamic agriculture as a basis for whatever we are going to do. But we have then also to have in mind that the, in the ecosystem needs also our attention in regard to water, climate, renewable energy and so on. And we really have to include in our organic and biodynamic schemes footprints of different dimensions which are not in our focus at the moment. And yes, we want to measure the impact of these products on uh, the community and the development of the community or on the development of each individual member of this community. Uh, but we do not see this addressed well enough in the current schemes uh, which all, by the way, are used by SACEM since 43 years, whether it's fair trade, whether it's organic or biodynamic or Demeter or whatever you want to name. So we believe that we have also there to develop some new indicators which really show our impact on cultural development, spiritual development, education, research and so on. And last but not least, we believe that the transparency along the whole value chain, which is already a topic in the organic movement, which is already addressed by many of our social entrepreneur colleagues and others, must be a focal issue. And uh, we have developed a tool called Impact Trace. This is the tool which we uh, have uh, developed to trace uh, the economy of love products from the farm, from the farmer to the final consumer, step by step. 
to reconnect the farmer and the consumer, moving with the product from the original farmer uh, to the packing facility, to the suppliers of packaging material, to all the locations where the product is moving, stored, distributed, to finally come to a true cost accounting exercise. Because this is obviously still one of the very important challenges. Moving with the product does not only mean to move from with the anise seed of this wonderful organic anise and Demeter anise filter bags from the field to the packing station to the packaging material as you can see below but also to really move with all the people involved in this product and this is what impact trace really is providing to everyone who is interested but to come up with uh, a comparison of the true price of the real price of the product which is one of the aims of this scheme uh, we need to compare it then to competitors, conventional competitors, because in the shelf, these conventional competitors always look cheaper than our product. And we don't believe that they are really cheaper. Comparing conventional products with uh, such a product which is uh, under the uh, scheme of economy of love, uh, comparing it on all dimensions, and I only selected three of the environmental sphere, which I just want to show you here to make clear what we really try to value and put into this scheme of the economy of love to provide the consumer with sound information. When we, for example, look on the impact on water of our product in comparison to a conventional one, we will see that we, in each one of these boxes, use 25 liters water less than a conventional tea bag. In a country which lives at water stress, water scarcity, like Egypt, this is a very important piece of information. And from the other side, a product which is sold in Egypt for about 20 Egyptian pounds, one sterling pound or less, it's important to know that a conventional box, which is cheaper in the shelf, costs the government five pounds to uh, mitigate the water damage cost of this box through so pesticides, chemical fertilizers, and so on. From the other side, we also look to the carbon footprint, and whereas the Demeter product is sequestering 75 grams of this carbon per box, the conventional, in the best case, is not sequestering uh, uh, carbon and the opposite, in most cases, mitigating carbon. And uh, last not least, we also have an impact assessment on health and we have some numbers from the WHO and FAO and others that which shows that each one of these boxes, in the best case, has an impact on the health and medical cost of our products. So, to conclude, what I want to say is that we believe that the economy of love uh, scheme, which we are following since 43 years now, uh, is a scheme which aims to supply the information needed for sound purchase decisions for our consumers at the first place. Obviously, it also aims to reinvent the way we do business in Egypt and in the world. But uh, we are very, very happy that finally now we are able to launch this uh, scheme in Egypt and other countries in Europe uh, under this label of economy of love, uh, because we are sure that this will contribute to a change of purchasing behavior a change into a more sustainable purchasing behavior of consumers all over the world. And we know that there are many people around that will not believe this, but we still believe that in 2057 in Egypt, most of the companies will use economy of love as a scheme because it's requested by consumers, because it's more efficient, more productive and more profitable for entrepreneurs, farmers and everyone in the supply chain. 
And uh, for those who do not believe this uh, and will tell us this is dreaming and this is crazy, I can only answer in the words of Nelson Mandela, it always seems impossible until it's done. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks so much, Halmi. That was really a great talk. Um, so now we've got the rest of our panelists here to challenge you, question you, give some thoughts and perspective. Um, and to kick us off, I'm going to get to Patrick Holden of the Sustainable Food Trust. Patrick, have you got something to say to Halmi? Um, hello, Halmi. It's lovely to uh, to see you and to uh, uh, to have visited you on multiple occasions. And as ever. Uh, I think you are amazing in your vision and your development of your pushing of the horizons. And uh, in relation to the economy of love, uh, I think it's really powerful to bring together this idea of um, put, extending the way in which we put a monetary value on things. Because in a way, you know, it is all about the money, but until now, the money uh, hasn't captured, it's captured goods, things that farmers produce. And now there's a big debate about natural capital, but actually what you're doing is extending it uh, to human capital and spiritual capital. And I think this is amazing. Uh, what I would ask you is that it seems to me that because you're, you're showing such leadership in this, there's the question of whether we can harmonize uh, the work that you're doing on developing ways of measuring um, human capital, spiritual capital, love, health, uh, so that we have common ways of measuring it, to put it in sort of crude terms, metrics. And as you know, the, the Sustainable Food Trust, my organization has been working a lot on true cost accounting. And then we realized that actually, if we we're going to have a, a, to put proper values on things, we'd have to measure them in a common way. And I, I would love to work with you, SECM, on, 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 on this harmonization process. Patrick, thank you very much. And uh, you know that uh, this is uh, something we aim for since ever. And I'm looking forward to engage in this. We can only learn. I'm happy that we have already, as you know, many of our friends engaged in this kind of schemes, whether it's Volker Engelsmann from Eosta or Tobias from Son and More. Johanna is here with us on this call, with whom we hope to start very soon to work on a balance sheet. Uh, according to their experience. And yes, I'm looking forward to share, join forces, and see how can we support farmers in the end with this information to have a better livelihood. Uh, and uh, at this, allow me just to uh, open this topic, which we already discussed once before. We still believe that we are much more efficient and cheaper than our conventional competitors, but this doesn't show on the shelf. And we are now really trying to help our farmers through schemes like carbon sequestration, um, uh, carbon credits and other things to get some money for the additional services they are providing, whether it's in water management, energy management, soil management and so on. And uh, I'm very glad to say that I'm hopeful that soon, in Egypt at least, soon, we will be able to produce a valuable, uh, high quality demeter and biodynamic products at prices uh, much better than many conventional com farmers can do because their systems are broken, their systems are expensive, have losses and uh, do not uh, optimize incomes anymore. Well, I've got another question, but I'll give way to Julie Brown now because I think she wants to come in, but I, I hopefully I'll have another chance to challenge you. Yes, okay. Oh, am I? Yes, hello. Um, hi, Helmi. It's great to hello. see you. We were, we, were, we were slightly worried there at the beginning that we won't be able to he hear you properly, but so that was great to hear that. Thank you very much. Um, I think the thing that's most... Uh, what... In terms of what Grown Communities does, the focus that we take, I think we can all agree that what we need is more climate and nature friendly farming to be happening as much as possible, as much of that to be happening as possible. How we identify climate and nature friendly farmers is, is interesting in terms of your approach to certification of production systems, so organic 
biodynamic. That's very much in line with how we identify climate and nature friendly farmers. Um, I also think there's a really interesting issue around routes to market, which from our perspective, what I think growing communities is trying to do is provide alternative routes to market for, for, for climate and nature friendly farmers. We've seen that to be, we see the supermarket system and the way that the money flows in that system as, as counterproductive to uh, enabling more climate and nature friendly farmers to actually make a living. So, um, so we very much focus on the idea of uh, creative alternative routes to market, which is what our box scheme is and our farmer's market. And also we have the concept that we're starting to call farmer focused. And what we mean by farmer focused routes to market is ones that get more of the food, the, the customer pound to, to the farmer. Um, um, and ideally over half, 50%, we, I mean, we get 56% compared to the UK supermarket system, which is sort of 8%. Um, and then the other thing that we're really focusing on is making sure doing our very best to make sure on the other side, our customers' diets and their expectations of what food they get is aligned with what our farmers are best able to produce throughout the year. So we're, we're sort of, we're, we're going round the supermarket system. And, and so I'm, I'm really interested uh, in your thoughts on why you're not doing that and why you think that your approach, that going through that system is 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 actually the best way to do it or the way that you're exploring at the moment. Yeah, thank you for the question. I want to uh, clearly say I love uh, all kinds of alternative routes to market, whether it's CSAs, box schemes, direct uh, shops on farms and so on. I think, uh, and from my experience, consumers are losing any idea what the farm is really looking like, where milk comes from and meat and everything else. So I think, yes, this is absolutely something which we would promote. In the end, aiming for 100% organic farming and 100% organic products, we need to reach consumers where they are, wherever they are, all over Egypt, whether they are in supermarkets, health food shops, pharmacies, uh, grocery stores, or uh, directly supplied through box schemes or picking up their products from the farm. We support all these schemes. We believe in all of them. We have even uh, online direct supply to many of our clients, which also love fresh produce from, from Seke. Um, we do believe that the important thing is that even those in the supermarket, get the picture of the farm, the farmer, the place where it comes from, and what percentage of the price is going to this farmer. This does not mean we would not love to invite more consumers to our farms or our health shops, our own shops, to give them their more information or to engage with them, even on a scheme where the price of the product is not any more related to the quantity of product, but to cover the livelihood of the farmer, which I think is the ultimate goal. Farmers are serving more than just producing some kilos of potatoes, environment, ecosystems, water, air, soil, and many, many other things, landscapes, beauty, and so on. And to really value all of them, we will have to delink somewhere in the future prices to farmers or income of farmers, let's say, from, uh, from product prices. So this all will come. Uh, in the next 40, 50 years, but we st start wherever we can, uh, being very optimistically targeting 100% of, of Egypt. So, so just to follow up on that, would it be possible for you to tell us a little bit more about how you, how you ensure that your farmers are able to compete within that system, you know, within, within the centralized system? So how do you make sure that more of the money goes to them or that their costs are reduced or how, how does the how does the, the the economic elements of that work? I mean, you were talking more about that previously when we caught I, up earlier. First of all, I invite you to have a look to the website where Economy of Love for the first products we are launching now is already uh, presented. There, you will find the true cost accounting exercise for the product, and we do this for every single product. The nice thing is that we are farmers and processors and traders at the same time. So we do this exercise with our farmers. So we know what is their cost 
we supply them with the inputs, the organic and biodynamic inputs of many of the inputs they need, whether it's seeds, biopesticides or others. And hence, we know what is the fair price, including the margins they need to, to really develop their livelihoods, give their kids a chance to go to school, to university. We have many of our farmers giving their kids are going to our school, to our university and have cultural development programs, have musical programs, have theater programs every month and so on. So we are really doing quite a lot to make sure it's about the development of each individual farmer. And we try to build this into the price, but we also have a scheme where as the bigger second community, including our farmers, some of the incomes of any of the activities always covers uh, this development approach. So we have a second development foundation, we have a space, we have a theatre in every governorate where we are active, we have weekly or monthly performances, we have education programs, health programs, so we really make sure that this development side of our farmers is addressed as much as we also work with them on biodynamic, improving the biodynamic method and inputs and outputs and I don't know what. Okay, thank you. Fascinating. Thanks, Julie. <laughs> um, so I got, jo Joanna, I've got a bit of a question for you related to some of the stuff um, that Helmi was talking about as well. So from your perspective in the system that you guys have in Region Alwa, um, I wanted to find out a bit more how you manage the routes to market for your farmers within your system. And if you could also tell us a bit more about the true cost accounting that you apply. So yes, that. sure. Thank you for, for taking me in <laughs> and hello, everybody. So I'm working for Regionalwirt AG in, in Freiburg in Germany, and it is a citizen shareholder company. And um, social and ecological services of, of farms, of organic farms, are seen as, as part of the return on investment. So people who, um, who buy shares in our company um, buy shares of organic farms and processes and retailers in the region um, to make it possible for them to exist and to um, compete on the market in the region. So, but we say that on the long run, sustainability services of these organic farms and so on need to be financially valued uh, and integ integrated into the, the normal accounts. So we say we in the future, we need an extended sustainability accounting. It actually goes right into the direction of what Helmi was talking about. And um, this is what we treat in our research projects. And um, we think that the, the crucial point is that sustainability services need to be monetized. And this is what we really work on. And I, um, I feel like there's also a little difference between our um, approaches to the topic because we really, of course, we consider the impacts of the ecological and social services of the farmers but most importantly for a farmer is like the costs he or she has um, providing a sustainability service and here's also like a question to to help me like do you also like you talked a lot about the impacts and con compared it to a um, conventional product but in calculating the, the the true cost do you also consider the, the costs for the farmers or like what it means for him in practice um, to to be organically? Uh, I hope I got your question right, but we are issuing every two years or something a report, a comparative report about two costs of the most important crops in Egypt, organic versus conventional. And in this report for farmers in the delta, in the 5,000 year old Nile delta and in the desert, we include every cost aspect uh, which is directly paid first, and this is obviously irrigation in Egypt and uh, fertilization and people and uh, seeds and biocontrol and many, many other things, and have hence a comparison of the direct costs involved before we go to those which we call indirect, and these include at the moment uh, the 
CO2 sequestration or mitigation, water pollution or not, water quantity uh, and uh, uh, use on the farm. Uh, and uh, this is basically the things which we can measure with the information we have available in Egypt on conventional and organic farming systems. We have problems still to monetize this on social impact, health impact, and other environmental impact. Uh, and uh, this is why we'd love to share our experience with you to really get a hand on how to value biodiversity and many, many other of the ecosystem services our farmers are providing. But there are no comparative numbers and nothing we can build on a real true cost accounting study comparative to conventional. Sure, thank you so much. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> um, I, I... Thank you, Johanna. Um, Julie, I believe there was a little bit you wanted to tell us about a study you guys have recently yes, done. Yes, I just wanted right? to say that, I mean, it's, it's, it's sorry, it's not, it's not a blatant plug, or maybe it is. We've got a session at six when we're actually going to explain more about a study that we've recently done in terms of the growing community supply chains. It's a slightly different, it's not, tr it's not quite true cost accounting. It's what we've been doing is trying to monetize uh, the value to each and all of the stakeholders that we work with. So looking at the farmers, the environment, our customers, the community, you know, uh, so, um, so it's more like, a, it's more of a social return on investment. But what was really fascinating as far, I mean, the results are really, are really, really great and interesting. So I really would love if people would want to come along to that session. But what was really interesting about it as well was that the environmental benefits and the things that we're trying to look at in terms of public goods, in terms of elms, these were the hardest things to find any data and any way of measuring or monetizing. So it's actually, it's, it's kind of like the, the key thing that we're trying to uh, to work out how to reward farmers for or to, you know, to, to get, that's, that's the data that's really hard to get hold of, um, which is, um, which is kind of shocking actually, really, uh, but also is obviously something that we need to really work on shocking but not surprising <laughs> no sadly that's also yeah so it's not shocking shocking but not shocking yes exactly because but you, yeah you measure what you value or you you know it's that it's that it's that relationship and uh yeah but great yes. that you've at least identified that that's where the work needs to be done so yes absolutely i mean we managed to monetize some things but there were loads of bits that we weren't able uh, able to um yeah but yeah more work to do but that actually leads quite nicely into an audience question, um, which links into something Patrick mentioned at uh, last year's conference, I believe. And um, so one of the audience members has asked, um, Patrick suggested that taste is perhaps the best technology we have. Do you think love could be equal to taste or even better? Help me. Oh, yeah. I, I believe that uh, taste is the number one reason uh, for the choices of consumers uh, if they don't have other information available and they don't and the price is not the biggest uh, uh, obstacle and uh, we are very happy about this to be honest we are selling 800 million tea bags of herbal teas and are the market leaders in Egypt competing with whom competing with Unilever multinationals like Twinnings and Ahmed T or national companies. And why do we have 800 million and are 78% of the market? I believe because of the taste, even more than because of Demeter or organic or any other certification, it's the best taste available in the market. So yes, I strongly believe that the taste is also one of the, of the, of the indicators which will help us to get a better uh, market share and a better um, position against uh, against consumers. From the other side, because I also uh, yeah, I want to, to be very clear, this is obviously with herbal tea quite easy and much more difficult with wheat and rice and many other products. So it doesn't work everywhere. But for some of the products, and I'm happy that some of them are our important products, it works as an indicator very, very well. 
Thanks, Harmi. Um, there's a, f a further question, and Josh, if we could get the other panelists up on the screen, that would be great as well. Um, I would love to comment on this, but when thank you, well, maybe. Patrick, why don't you do that? Because we'll probably move on to some other questions. So please do. Okay. Well, I just want to say that I think uh, Johanna and Julie and Helmi are all talking about the need to put a, a value on things, but. It, uh, and we, my, my organization, the Sustainable Food Trust, we produced a report in 2017 called The Hidden Costs of UK Food. And the headline what, from it was that for every pound that is currently spent on food, there's another hidden pound which we're not paying for. So the food pricing is dishonest. But really, in a way, underlying all this is we need a common language for measuring the impact of food systems, including taste, including love, but also including the more basic elements of the impact of the uh, the farming system and it seems to me that we need to be inclusive in that so we need a language which includes all the capitals and all the impacts but it would be a common language between nations so that i could talk to uh say one of the producers who are uh, supplying julie or indeed to sekem and I could say, what is your what is your um, impact of your study on um, using the same metrics and categories as I'm using on my farm, for instance? And if we have this common language, then we could move forward and include all the conventional producers as well. Because, you know, as somebody who's involved with the development of the organic standards, um, I now feel it's too binary approach just to say, are you organic or are you not organic? We need something which includes all producers, whether they're intensive, regenerative, agroecological, biodynamic, we need a common way of measuring the impact of their systems. If we had that, it would be an amazing new language through which we could communicate sustainability and we would, we would avoid some of these schisms. And that's what I really wanted to, to say to Helmi. We must work together on this. Julie, did you Julie have something? To say, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I, we don't have that language yet. And I'm really, really concerned that we will throw the organically certified baby out with the biodynamic bathwater here. I think we really, sorry, I don't know where that came from. Anyway, that was a whole multiple mixture of metaphors phrase. there. But, but I don't think you meant uh, the biodynamic bathwater. Yes, no. I and mean, I, think, I think this issue has come up in loads and loads of, I mean, I, I have absolute sympathy for the fact that we don't want to, you know, we don't want to have um schisms and we want to bring people who are traveling in the right direction in terms of production and farming you know farming systems we want to bring them on board but i also think that we absolutely need common at the moment a, a baseline for how we are from a retailer perspective identifying which production systems are we are considering to be climate and nature friendly and at the moment for us Organic is the proxy for that. Organic and biodynamic is our baseline proxy. I have absolute sympathy for people who think they're doing better than that uh, through agroecological or regenerative or anything like that. But I also am completely worried or, or fear that basically the concept would be co-opted by people who are doing a lot worse than that. And I also have yeah, absolute sympathy for small-scale that... farmers who can't afford it. So I don't. Want, I know you're saying it. That is what you're saying, what but we don't say. have that in place yet. So it's really important that we have some externally validated way of judging what is an a, 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 a nature and kind of friendly farming system. And organic is the best we have at the moment. I would. I would argue. I agree, and I'm organically certified. But all I'm saying is what you're saying is not mutually exclusive from the existing certification schemes. If they could be connected up so you could see whatever the other certification schemes were, whether it's Red Tract or Leaf or anything, you had a score on it. And you say uh, growing communities would only buy organic and biodynamic products, but you would also see the relative sustainability, including all the things that Helmi's talking about. Uh, and then you could make, the, the people who are buying the food can make a more reasonable comparison, more objective comparison. There's actually a, a audience question that ties in really well to what we're discussing. So I just want to bring that in. Um, so reward systems for farmers will be very difficult to quantify and implement. Also will reward only those that are good at applying for grants and leave others struggling. If artificial fertilizers are made prohibitively expensive, using carbon taxes or polluter pays, 
a true cost system is best suited to resilience going forward and less open to corporate abuse. How can we ensure this becomes a reality? Now, I, from my perspective, this ties in to what you're saying about different approaches and getting the, all the elements across the board on a, on a level field, so to speak, so that we can identify what's what. So perhaps part of that approach is to identify the negative things and have a kind of tax on them rather than... Yeah. Supposing every producer in the world had an annual sustainability audit and you would see the impact of their systems, including the negative impacts, and then you could put a cost on that and then you could incentivize farmers, maybe through government grants, maybe through a labelling. And I think it's all, it's all connected with what everyone's really saying. I'm simply saying we need harmonisation. We need to move towards it if we're going to address climate change and all the other things because we're trashing the planet at the moment. We haven't got time. I'm not arguing with you, Julie. No, well, I'm I'm going to argue with you though. That's so that's <laughs> sadly going to be <laughs> good. Um, I, I don't think we're disagreeing, Patrick, about what it is that we need in the future. What I'm saying is what we've got now and how we support and undermine or how we get towards what we need. I mean, in terms of the question around rewards, I mean, you know, I think all of us are still in the in the UK uh, hanging on and hope that Elms. The new ELM schemes will provide some of this. But I think that as time goes on, we're sort of, you know, losing losing hope that actually it is going to get money going into, you know, going in the right direction, or or if there isn't even going to be any money. Um, so, so that was one way of balancing the equation is to reward people for the public goods that they deliver, farming systems that are, you know, are doing great things for the environment and the nature. Um, and then the other side is obviously the true cost accounting side is to is to start legislating or or taxing or whatever on the other side for the damage that's caused. So uh, uh, again, the challenge back to you, Patrick, at the at the uh, at the um, at um, Oxford, I don't know, three or four years ago, I asked a question from the floor saying, you know, in terms of true cost accounting, what policies and what fiscal measures would you be actually recommending that the rest of the movement could kind of get behind and start campaigning for? For instance, a carbon tax or a nitrogen tax or a, or a plastic, you know, that, that was, would, is there a policy ask that we could actually start getting behind and supporting on the true cost accounting side? Well, I'm t look, I, d I don't want to take any more of the time, but I think there is. I think a nitrogen tax, if we could, if we could put a price on the negative impact. Pesticide tax. Of, yes, absolutely. We need to tax practices or impacts of a negative nature in relation to the actual monetary damage done. Once we've got a common language, that will become easier. So, yes, I think the answer to your question is. So in terms of practical application, here is the answer or the potential solution to get all these different bodies and organizations from soil association sustainable food trust biodynamic association anyone else who's involved in any kind of gathering around um even regenerative agriculture all of us together to create some form of lobbying for policy or do we just start doing it regardless of um political agreement i think we do and i think that the organic movement and you know let's it may recognize that SECM have been leading in this for decades Absolutely. we need to sit around together and work out how we can contribute towards being the architects of a harmonized system of measuring and valuing sustainable farming and that should include the organic and biodynamic farmers we don't have to reject anything that we've done before no. it's it's just meeting this new challenge Thank you. Um, just to quickly let everyone know as well, because we will run out of time shortly, uh, there will be a continuation of um, an open uh, questions to the audience on Zoom after this. The Zoom link will be posted in the chat now. And for anyone who would like any additional um, details on either growing communities, SACEM, Regional World, or Sustainable Food Trust, we do have a page with all the links gathered together that uh, my colleague will paste in the chat for you as well, if people wanted to follow up and read some more uh, details on that. Um, thank you very much, Helmi, for joining us. Um, hopefully we'll see you in the Zoom chat afterwards as well. Yes. Julie? Great. Yes, Julie. Oh, no, I was just nodding and saying, yes, oh. Helmi has to be there. <laughs> <laughs> I was starting to say, come across to the Zoom, everyone.
Yes. <laughs> Let's continue this conversation. Yeah, I would. I think that works. Um, tell me, hasn't had a chance to come in recently, or Johanna probably wants to come in again. I could see. Yes, yeah, sure. I, I was just. Is the Zoom session about to start right now, or at four uh, three o'clock? Um, well, we've got the Zoom link. I believe it's been posted for the audience and posted for us. I know we still have a few minutes on our crowdcast time here, so I didn't want to stop us. I was just making sure we told everyone before we got cut off. <laughs> yeah, sure. Maybe just a little comment on the on the discussion that Julie and Patrick had, because I feel like it's so great that we're together here and we all agree that the economy needs to change. And I feel like we are the ones who develop ideas and concepts and a, a common language. And on the on the other hand, or um, simultaneously, we need to pressure politics to do taxes on pesticides. To like this needs to um, to strengthen itself, and so this is how we get to a change. I feel. Maybe, maybe I also add one word. Uh, I, I always love uh, when I meet with Europeans how they are able to complain with very loud voices on a very high level. Because when you complain now about agriculture in Europe, uh, you forget totally about farmers in Egypt and governments which cannot afford even to think about reward systems or anything else. But the advantage we have is that in our case, we will be much quicker in the transformation because nobody is going to support the unsustainable systems for too long because we cannot afford to do it. Huh? You said, we are not paying the true price, but somebody is going to pay the next generation or we pay it today with our taxes. There is no expense which nobody pays huh, in the world. It's simply we just push it to someone we don't know, whether it's my grandchildren or I push it to my neighbor who is going to pay it over his tax bill. But there's no cost which we can escape. Huh? And this is the reality in Egypt, and this is why I am optimistic that in Egypt we will be very soon seeing a change because the government cannot afford to subsidize this unsustainable behavior with billions and billions. And so they are now already going to more just prices for energy, for other things. The input of organic farmers are getting cheaper and cheaper versus conventional every day. And uh, this is not because they are producing more or less quality or anything. Simply their inputs and the prices go up. So I am happy to contribute. I'm happy to join forces to create such a scheme. I believe it exists and it can be done. And I think FAO and others are also working on this. And we just should join forces and come up with a, a global system which can be used everywhere. Great. Thanks, Halmi. Um, that actually ties into one of the other questions posed, which I hope we'll get to address in um, the Zoom session, thinking about how we can include people into this economic way, regardless of their circumstances, because there, um, many people may want to make a better choice, but they can't necessarily afford to in the current way that it works. So that would be interesting to address as well. So I think looking at the time, it's probably a good idea if we do head on over to Zoom um, and then we can get onto that question. So thank you very much everybody for joining and we'll see you on the Zoom chat. Thank you, see you. See you, goodbye. Bye. Bye. So are we gonna be given the Zoom link now? Um, the Zoom link is in chat. the chat um, right. in, the, in the backstage area. So you just leave the studio. Oh, got it. Got it? I think so, yeah. <laughs>